Okay, we're gonna start now. Hello and welcome to our talk, Making Drupal Fly the Fast Drupal Ever is Near. Um, it's presented by Wim Liers here from Akia and by me, Fabian Franz. And we'll today show you the master plan of Drupal 8 performance or of performance in general that we've been working tirelessly on. And um, I think, let's start. So, that might be a little provocative question, the fastest ever Drupal. Are you serious? You're kidding, right? But I saw Drupal 8 was so slow. Everyone told me that. So it must be true. <laughs> and besides that, I read that blog post by Vim that page cache is now enabled by default in Drupal 8, but, but that's no big deal. Page cache was already in Drupal 7. Um, that does not count, except it does, and we will show later why. Um, so just to prove you what I mean and what we've been working on, let's take a look at a short demo to show you that. So um, this is our little demo site, and we'll have to um, do some playing around um, just so that it all fits on screen everywhere. And um, for your convenience, I put in some meta information at the top of the page. So um, this is one of those uh, complex sites that Dries talked today about that's very dynamic and uh, yesterday about in his keynote that's very dynamic and that has a lot of dependencies and content, etc. And uh, now it's your task to make that site fast, and, uh, but we still need to um, retain it dynamically. And Dries yesterday said in his keynote when he had this slide with the uh, loading blocks and also the mention of BigPipe um, that it's not in core yet. So, but what he didn't say is that we actually have a patch already in the queue in core and um, this is kind of the patch that I will present you today um, that could bring BigPipe to core if enough people help review the patch and if you get it in. So um, here we have a very dynamic site branding block. Um, it has a username, it has some dynamic information like timestamp, and it even has the same pass. So, um, it's about as complex as you can get, and while that is now an artificial example, let me tell you that on many client side, I've seen similar scenarios that um, are um, really where that block took three seconds to render, and um, where it was just some different logic. So this is just a simplified example, but you can very, very well uh, reuse that in the real world. So, um, as I said, we are loading this page and we're waiting, 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 and it's three seconds. So, um, this is a problem. So, let's, let's take a look why this page is slow. Um, let's say by some testing out, we found out, well, it really is this site branding block that's making things slow. So, Wim here has written a very, very neat tool of how you can analyze such a uh, site uh, in terms of how we would be able to cache that. And so what we can see here is so-called cache context, which is the variation of the page on what it variates, and there we have a problem, it variates by user. That means uh, even if we try to cache that page for the next user, it would again be slow. And um, also we see that this cache uh, variates by URL. And then we also have this very dynamic timestamp that whenever I'm refreshing that um, after it comes back um, is actually here and um, increasing dynamically showing the time. So um, with this um, tool called RenderVis, what we can do is we are setting uh, like we want to find everything that's not cacheable on that page. And um, now uh, Wim's tool automatically detected um, that it's this timestamp that makes the whole page uncacheable because we can see um, that this timestamp is kind of going um, 
uh, up to the tight branding block, to the region, to the site, and at the end to the page. So this is why it's not cacheable. This is why we have problems caching that. Isn't that cool? But it's just still a uh, prototype, as you can see, because he's fudging in the web developer tool. So if anybody of you is interested in helping, it, uh, helping out with this, especially with a fancy 3D CSS in which I am no expert at all, please come talk to us, because this could be really, really cool in Drupal 8. The other thing is um, we saw this user context, so we want to uh, find out what is actually um, making this site um, um, depend on the user. So what we put in is this render with context user, and uh, we see, okay, it's again this site branding block, in this case a whole block um, that deviates by user. It bubbles up this information, uh, so we have a problem. And then we have set URL, and it automatically directly detected that this is a reason why um, this thing, um, again, is not cacheable. And um, even if that big pipe demo block now could be cached by user because it includes this very dynamic URL, it would be different uh, on each page again. So we have problems. Um, in a real-world scenario, that would be a smart cache where we are trying to, even for authenticate users, cache all the pages. Um, if you have something that deviates by user or variates by user, and you have 100,000 pages, you have 100 users, and you have like 10 million uh, entries in your cache, which is obviously not very workable. So um, the way how we are fixing this is by using placeholders. So now that we've now that Drupal kind of has this information, we have this information of a user, we have this information of a URL, we have this information of a max h0. We do some little trick, uh, which I've compromised here into this demo. Um, but um, we are telling Drupal what we want is a single flash rendering strategy, which means that it should use placeholdering, but still in the end serve a whole page to the thing. And we'll see how um, that works. Um, what's cool about that is that uh, Drupal is able to determine from this information that you are seeing on screen automatically what it needs to place, how, or how. And this is what we're going to activate now. So um, we're putting the render strategy single flush in. And we are reloading the page. Um, the first time it still takes 3.1 seconds, uh, but something has changed. So if we again take a look at um, this render viz and we take a look at the max age, what we now see is um, the max age is actually um, still detecting this is a dynamic thing, but there's no more red borders around the site branding blocks. There's no more red borders around the, um, the sidebar. There's just one red border around the whole page because we are still doing it in the same request. So. Um, um, in this case, um, this branding block now becomes cacheable. The other thing is um, the URL thing. This has been placeholder as well because URL is something that deviates much. So it doesn't um, go up to anywhere because the page is obviously already by URL. So this is nothing that um, bubbles up in that. And now for the user thing, um, we can see that that whole block is still per user and also then the whole page is per user. But the, the sidebar region, if you want to cache that differently, we could, um, because um, it's no longer bubbling up to that region. Um, now, if you reload that, some magic happens. Because now uh, this page only takes 0 0.58 seconds instead of 3 seconds. And that is because, um, actually, we are now caching this block. And I think that, yep, it can tell that even. Um, that this block is now cached. And then we still have um, our two placeholders in here, which is that one, which doesn't bubble up, and the max age one. So um, this is kind of the magic of, um, of this placeholdering. And, um, but still, there's still some delay feelable, and there's kind of this rule of thumb of having this below 0 0.5 seconds, and we are above that. Uh, we can do better, and this is where BigPipe comes into the, into play. Um, 
With BigPipe, we are enabling just another render strategy. Uh, we are reloading that page, and whoa. <laughs> what was that? So now this page, um, let's do it again. So now this page just takes like uh, 0.07 seconds to render to uh, be completely there. And if you have a fast server connection, it will directly be there. And uh, it says conveniently there's this uh, render strategy big pipe and then what you can't see because um, that's a little too long on the screen. Oh. Okay, uh, Bim has some tricks. Um, <laughs> There's the time to stream the rest of the page, and this is actually the 0 0.5 seconds. Uh, so let's do it again. Uh, we didn't do that because of the responsive uh, thingy here. But um, yeah, you can see by clicking on a home, and after the 0 0.5 seconds, it tells you then that it streamed the rest of the page. Um, so, and if you take a look here, uh, I think we need to resize again. Yeah, resize again. Okay, here we go. Um, and if you now uh, click on the home and we, yeah, let's remove this one. Uh, if you click on the home, um, then what we're actually seeing is this um, timestamp that's just coming after the fact. So it kind of has everything already streamed, but this dynamic timestamp, that what takes so long, so it can even help you uh, find performance problems by just placeholding something and seeing how long it takes. Um, actually, I've, um, uh, that even works in the real world when I was uh, checking how long kind of like um, for a node if you have this action links like edit, etc., how long that takes to render or the comment render form. Once it was placeholder in big pipe, it was kind of immediately visually visible uh, how that works. But yeah, we have a page that's really, really fast to be. And we are streaming um, the remainder automatically here. Um, so um, this is Big Pipe and Drupal 8 Core. Um, what we also now see is, um, if you take a look um, at the render this again, um, then we can see um, we still have that same placeholders here, um, but the max H0 doesn't even bubble up to the page anymore because now we are rendering it after the page. So even the page cache could cache this now um, because the placeholders are um, just um, afterwards replaced. So there's no longer even a red border around the, um, uh, around the whole page. And this one is still cached uh, so our page is still per user. But that's a problem. We don't want to have this page per user. We really want to have that like that. And now um, what's really cool about the rendering placeholder strategies is um, placeholders have a name, like a unique ID, or you can even define um, a name. And um, in this case, I've called this uh, placeholder some special name. And um, if I'm and I see that pretty much what this is doing we could totally do in JavaScript. So what I did was um, I was um, adding some little cookies here um, that are available for JavaScript. Of course, if all your pages are cached, you need one AJAX request to create those cookies. Um, but that's a technique we actually use for some enterprise clients um, I take one. Um, so um, we have the username tester. We even have the user roles here, which we need a little later. And so um, in Drupal settings, actually, there's all information for the current pass. Uh, okay, or not? <laughs> oh, it's dot pass. Yeah, dot pass. Dot current pass. There we are, and then there's also the base pass. It works <laughs> in the code. Uh, so let's quickly activate the uh, JS and single flush. So all that does is kind of take this site branding block, which we now is already a placeholder, and instead of uh, rendering it on the server, we are rendering it completely client-side. Um, 
we refresh that page, um, we still have a very fast page delivery time. We have no more um, uh, streaming time, so there's uh, nothing that is streamed now, and this placeholder is now completely uh, rendered client side. And with that, we have made the page fast, but what's really cool about that now is um, that by now, if you take a look at the context, there's nothing anymore that deviates this page by, uh, by the user context. So if you take a look here at the cache context, there's only user roles, which is by now in Drupal 8 core user permissions, but that's not so important. Um, there's no more things from that site branding block at all. So let's take a look at what all deviates by user roles. And that's pretty much a lot. Um, so what you could now do, and that was unfortunately out of scope for, because we still want to get you some more information in how this all works and how you can do it yourself, uh, but it would totally be possible to just cache this whole page in Varnish now and um, you would have a fast site in that. And that is why um, I'm saying this can be the fastest Drupal ever, because it, if you give Drupal the information to make things fast, um, Drupal 8 can make very smart choices about that. Oh, and there was actually one little thing I forgot. Um, let's quickly switch back to Big Pipe um, because there's something else which is called, um, how do we remove that again? He's great at um, <laughs> shortcuts. So um, uh, with the Big Pipe, um, so we see here this is the, um, the timestamp is coming, but what about if that whole branding block was not cached for that user yet? You know it's cached by user, a new user logs in, um, what happens? Or if um, there's this path information in there which is cacheable but not dynamically recreatable in this case. So uh, what the system uh, can do is something called progressive enhancement, which means if you click now on the test article one, you see there's no site branding block yet. And then after a while it comes. So um, uh, similar to Facebook, um, where they use BigPipe all the time, um, we've now had a streaming time of 3.02 seconds, um, but our page was still really, really fast. And Facebook, if you try it out with a single flash strategy, it's a website that takes three seconds to load, 3.5 seconds to load. And without all the crazy speed hacks for PHP or the new hack language, they would even take seven to 10 seconds to load. So uh, a complex website takes long to load, um, but we can be smart about how to render it, how to cache it, uh, how to do those things. And uh, the next time I'm going to this article, once I have that already cached, it's in there and it's immediately fast. So yeah, progressive enhancement too. Talk. So what you just saw is, is part of the mission to make the whole web fast. It's a challenge by him, by Wim Lears, and I've decided to take it. Uh, so if you want to read that, um, that's a very great read. Uh, I originally read it without knowing that it's by him. <laughs> so um, uh, I just later realized he was the author and he was kind of pitching, well, if you want to make the web fast, we need to make Drupal fast, WordPress fast, Joomla fast, then all pages will be fast. And uh, what you just saw is a huge chance that everyone could profit from so that really the whole web could be faster. So that's a really ambitious goal. Uh, so let's see what fast means. It means for one user it's fast. It means if there are many, many users coming to the site, it's fast. And overall, uh, the speed of how something like that loads is always the time to first byte, which was kind of the first number you saw, plus asset loading, the rendering of the page, the JavaScript execution time, and we want to minimize that. So how do we achieve that in general? Um, it's very, very, very simple. You use static HTML pages. You use no CSS, no JavaScript, no images, and just text and links. <laughs> Seriously? No, of course not. So um, there's some truth to that, too. 
um, performance optimization means, means to do as little work as possible. We really want to do as little work as possible when a user visits our websites. Um, if you can do that, um, don't do it while the user is visiting your website. Do it in the background. Do it somewhere else. Um, but don't do it when the user is visiting your website. Use as little resources as possible. Not so many images, not so many scripts, not 20,000 megabytes of whatever. Um, so the critical pass, which is when the user visits your website and it needs to be fast for him, the process is, can we avoid doing the work at all? Can we avoid um, doing that? Can we improve the algorithm that it's just faster out of the box. Then, if that's not possible because we've already tried everything, can we avoid doing this work even during the critical pass? For some Drupal 7 examples, that would be, for example, to create a field that's permanently um, uh, storing some aggregated information, like some counter that increases, so yet that you don't need to uh, ask the database um, for how much the count now is of, of something. So um, do it in an update hook, store it permanently. But often that is also not possible. So is it possible to cache it permanently? Uh, is it possible to write smart invalidation, which we'll see later, um, to cache it permanently and never have to invalidate it? Um, and if that's not possible, could we cache it for 10 minutes? Could we cache it for 10 seconds? Uh, so uh, you can't imagine how much, uh, how much stress you can put off a web server that's heavily loaded if you just put in a cache for 10 seconds. Um, it's amazing. And then no content editor will say, well, if it's an hour after the content shows up, it's a problem, but after 10 seconds, usually not. Or defer, and that was kind of what you saw in with the big pipe, uh, executing it after the main content has been rendered. So remember this uh, acronym I've created here, avoid cache defer. Uh, if you remember that, that's kind of the, um, the process for all performance optimization. If, you, if you're doing it in that order, you're doing it right. Um, but caching, which we are now talking about, has problems. The content should be as current as possible, it should have a high cache at ratio, and it should have low cache invalidation uh, complexity. Um, that means you don't want to have much work with that. You want that if the editor publishes an article, they directly want to see it. And if that article is in the sidebar on 100,000 pages, and the title is wrong, and the CEO of the company says, uh, this title is wrong, we need to change it immediately. All those 100,000 pages should be current directly. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it doesn't help if you only, for example, cache for 10 seconds, then your cache hit ratio won't be as good as it could be. So choose two. You can't have all three. Um, th as examples for low, cache, uh, low complexity cache invalidation is what I've now already talked about, the time-based invalidation. So you can cache the pages unconditionally for a year. The content is not really current, but the cache at ratio is really, really great. Or you decide to just cache the pages never. Your content is always current, so you're always happy, um, but cache at ratio is 0% and probably performance will suffer a little. Um, yeah, and a lot of Drupal 7 sites work off that. Um, because either they don't even know there's a page cache. Page cache, what's that? That's checkbox? No. Um, or because they have this problem, well, my content was not current. Uh, okay, let's disable that caching. It, it just makes problems. Um, or you're going into a kind of like a compromise. You cache it for six hours, then it's quite current, and the cache it ratio is still acceptable. But for some cases, even that might not be enough because then you have that first user problem. Six hours have gone by, a new user comes, and then it's like, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. and um, that's obviously also a big resource problem because when we're talking about costs, um, that also directly shows in server costs because you just need more web heads for when your caches are stale, when your caches are out. So another uh, example for the low complexity invalidation is a clear all invalidation. 
when a page changes, clear the whole page cache. That's what Drupal 7 did, kind of like. It is an easy way out, but it's not really that nice. Um, high complexity cache and validation, for example, from Drupal 7 Contrib now, is to clear only what has cached, the expire varnish module in D7, the Akamai module, um, and other possible modules in that. So you need to, for example, purge expire all that 100,000 URLs you have um, that have this wrong title. And um, in Akamai, that can take from four minutes to 30 minutes, for example. Um, it can put a lot of stress on your Varnish server, etc. So there must be something better like that. Um, but this is a very high invalidation cost and also very high complexity. If you take a look into what lens, for example, uh, the expire module goes to find whenever a node or a node reference is somewhere embedded in that, etc. cetera. Um, that's very, very complicated and uh, also prone to error bugs. It works, but there's something better. So uh, Drupal 8 shows high complexity, so you can have high cache at ratio with um, uh, um, the content being as current as possible. The content is invalidated instantaneously and cached permanently for most cases. And the solution we have invented for that, or we have used for that, um, and proven it works for SCMS is cache tags, which Wim will explain later. Um, but caching even has more problems. The content should be varied by user, a group, a special permission, or our favorite example, the face of the moon. Um, so you have a granularity. You still want to have a high cache hit ratio, and that was kind of exactly that problem I was talking before. 100,000 pages, 100 users, 10 million cache entries. That's not workable. Um, you should have a low complexity, um, so um, you just don't want to have much logic to ensure those caches are granularly varied. And again, Drupal 7 shows a very easy way out. Um, in that it provided um, some granularities for the blocks, and then you could set them up. There was block cache all the way, you could do it dynamically. You could use some of that in panels or somewhere else, so there were some constant. It was all pretty simple. So again, choose two. Can't have all three. What again? Yes. Okay, and Drupal 8 shows high complexity again. Everything in Drupal 8 declares what it varies by. Whenever you write an if statement somewhere, you have, and it depends on anything that is outside of your current domain, of your current object, of what you are currently dealing with, you have to declare a cache context. That is very, very important. Uh, Wim will explain the sort process in a little more detail, um, but just in, in that thing, you have to do a little work um, to be able to enable Drupal to do what I've shown you in the demo before. Um, but this allows, for the first time ever, to cache authenticate user content securely with access check, without having to worry about that. Um, with, and it can work out of the box. Many things like OS cache, ESI module, etc., that are hard to set up, that have error streaks, etc., because Drupal 8 is designed that way, can work out of the box in that. And the solution for that is cache context and as you've already seen, this kind of automatic place ordering magic. So, wait a moment. Now the critics come. So, what about KISS? Keep it simple, stupid. You are creating this very complex system and yeah, we should be keeping it simple. Counter question. Who of you uses a database? I don't know what the others do, but. <laughs> <laughs> so databases actually are beasts of complexity. They're just hiding it from you. They're hiding all the complexity they're dealing with from you. There are some people that thought, well, databases are so easy, and they've used this no SQL things. But then you suddenly have to deal with all that stuff that the database hides from you yourself. And some NoSQL users in the end did go back to the database because in the end they had all that logic that 
before was taking care of them for them in their app. And it was like such a big app, but before it would have been just a little query. Um, so um, you don't see any of that complexity. You give it hints, like you give it a schema, you give it indexes, you give it information of how it can work best, and then it does its magic. And of, more often than not, very, very nicely. Um, and this is the same here for you. Drupal 8 makes it as simple as possible for you. And this is a huge opportunity, a very, very huge opportunity in the first time ever in Drupal in that, that we are doing all the caching logic internally. It's complex, yes. We have cache redirection. We are not talking about that today. We have placeholdering. We have cache context bubbling. We have a render stack. And uh, you don't need to understand any of that because it's all internal to Drupal. And it's all inside the renderer. It's all inside the render cache logic. But if you give Drupal the information, then it can be smarter about its decision. And it can empower you to build the fastest Drupal websites ever. So um, Drupal 8 formalizes those things in a kind of language which is those cache context, cache text, max it, to make your site fast. And um, yeah, and um, as I've promised on my slides, Drupal 7 can do the same. Um, yes, Drupal 7 can use the same language. Um, I've been working in parallel on a render cache 7x2x module. Uh, there's even a proof of concept already in directly using Drupal 8 code, um, directly the same code base. So in the end, you will have the same implementation. You will be able to use cache tags at a more limited scale, but um, in ways you can do it. Um, you can use cache context uh, using the service container module. At the moment, it's frozen because I'm concentrating on Drupal 8. Um, that's important because else I would just be porting stuff back, back and forth uh, without having one API finalized. So I'm at the moment concentrating on finalizing these APIs in Drupal 8, making them nice, then back porting it to Drupal 7. Oops. So, but how do I give this information? And that's what Wim will show you now. Yeah, that was quite a demo, right? I hadn't seen it myself completely up front, so yeah, very cool. Um, so Fabian uh, has been really instrumental in making the big pipe stuff work at all. I honestly wouldn't have known all the, wouldn't have been able to figure out all the details on how to make that work, but as Fabian said, the complexity is hidden from you, so um, not everybody needs to know all those details, just like databases. And so I will take a step back and look at uh, the things everybody will be interacting with, uh, that hopefully all of you will be interacting with in Drupal 8, and the things, the thought process that you apply while working, which is slightly different from Drupal 7, um, but hopefully you'll agree that um, it actually makes a whole lot of sense. So um, I'll get started. What everything is about in Drupal 8 and what is enabling the, the, thing, the things that, that Fabian has demoed is dependencies, 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 every, everywhere, because the reason behind that is that without those dependencies, we cannot possibly know which things we can cache when they should be invalidated, when they should be varied by something. Um, but it's not just about cacheability. Another thing that um, was problematic in Drupal 7 was uh, the fact that, for example, assets, we didn't do assets dependency handling. We just were calling Drupal add CSS and Drupal add JS from various pieces in uh, the Drupal code base in core and contrib, in pre-processed theme functions, but also in uh, page callbacks that built render arrays. The problem with that was that we were putting all of those assets that we needed to be loaded somewhere in a global state, but then we couldn't possibly know which pieces of markup that was associated with. For example, if you were adding some CSS that actually was there for theming your node, for styling your node, how could we possibly have known that some Drupal add CSS call somewhere in the code base was actually targeting that node markup. It was impossible. So in Drupal 8, what we are doing is making sure that you aren't calling these kinds of functions anymore and aren't putting stuff in a global state anymore, which only allowed for things to be cached at a page level, because global state corresponds to a page and doesn't allow us to know which things it actually belonged to. So it was really impossible to cache. And simply using pound attached and attaching libraries, which actually already existed in Drupal 7, but it wasn't enforced, by just consistently using that, 
we, for example, are able to make sure that BigPipe does load the proper assets, um, because that's pretty important too, right? It's, it's nice that the markup can be sent correctly and fast and is invalidated when necessary, but without the proper attachments, without the proper assets, uh, we would be looking at essentially a site without CSS and JS, which of course isn't nice. So this is something you can actually already do today. So start using pound attached and stop using individual CSS and JS assets. Always use libraries. That will slightly easier way to Drupal 8 because it's one thing that you've already grown accustomed to by the time that you start using Drupal 8. So that's one area of dependencies. But it wasn't just limited to this kind of rendering. Really, Drupal 7 was tracking, wasn't tracking dependencies anywhere or almost not anywhere. So a good example that is actually kind of independent of rendering, but that just very clearly shows Drupal 7s and earlier versions, because the URL function basically dates back to Drupal 4.6. I looked it up this morning. Um, the things it depends upon is quite scary when you think about it, because all you feed into the URL function is basically a path, right? You give it node 1, and it gives you back something like example.com slash fr if the current language is French slash node slash 1, or maybe even the URL alias. But just giving those examples already are, is giving it away uh, slightly because the things that the URL function depends upon is which, is which page is your front page, which path is your front page. That's something you aren't giving to the URL function, but it somehow is getting from somewhere. Whoa, I'm not sure what I did there. I think, okay, there we go. The HTTPS configuration, whether your site is enabled to support HTTPS, as in should the URLs point to the HTTPS version, yes or no. Uh, clean URLs, Do you, are you using the index.php query string q equals the path, or are you using clean URLs? Is the current site in a multi-site? The current host name, because usually a site can, or quite often sites can be accessed via multiple host names, so for example, Drupal.org or www.drupal.org, which means that if I'm accessing it through one, then all URLs should be using that one, and vice versa. Path processing, another one. So that's where, for example, the negotiated interface language is coming from, but you could even configure it so that the URL language was independent of the interface language and whatnot. Different path processors could be added as well. So as you can tell, the list is very, very long in the terms of things that it actually depended upon, but that you didn't give it directly, that was getting from somewhere, so you weren't actually considering those dependencies. And because of that, things are becoming uncacheable because if we give, if we call the URL function and give it a path, and we get back something that dynamically depended on so many things in the current context, how could we possibly have figured that out? There was no way. And so Drupal 8 is really about making sure that it's no longer impossible to cache. Well, it was actually possible to cache, but it was impossible to invalidate correctly. Um, so the problem in Drupal 7 was that we chose to cache anyway, despite it actually being impossible to invalidate correctly. And so that's what Drupal 8 is all about, correct invalidation. And the language that uh, Fabian was referring to earlier, uh, so the, the equivalent, if you will, of uh, SQL indexes, primary keys, constraints, or whatever else is in SQL, the equivalent in Drupal, in terms of cacheability, is then cache tags, cache contexts, and cache max age. And I'll go over them right now. So cache tags are about data dependencies. Declaring which things, which data in Drupal you depend upon. Cache contexts are about the context that the thing is being rendered in. We'll talk about more about that in a second. And max age is about the time dependencies. Basically saying, how long is this thing valid? How much time? Um, how much time is this actually valid for? And maybe it is permanently cacheable. Maybe it is only a limited period of time. Maybe it is a long period of time. But it's important to declare, if at all, there is a time dependency. And so these three things are really the only things you need to be worried about. Um, this is what you need to be thinking about every time. But under the hood, and Fabian already alluded to this, and this is the only bit of implementation detail that I think is. Uh, important to have a vague notion of, and if you want to, you can dig into it deeper. But basically, the, these three things, tags, context, and max age, are bubbled. Just like, for example, in JavaScript, events bubble. 
So everything from deeper in the tree, deeper in the DOM tree, bubbles up higher to the DOM tree, and equivalently in Drupal, deeper into a Drupal page, for example, a field in a node, that node is in a view, that view is in a block, that block is in a region, that region is in the page template. That's the tree, and we bubble up along that tree, so that at the highest level, we have a complete understanding of which things, which dependencies we actually are dealing with. And that's also why in the, in the demo that Fabian gave, the, the red outlines, the red borders, and the marking as red, those things, we are only able to to mark those things as red, we are able to know those things to be the, the things that have those cache tags or contexts or max age because we are bubbling it from the deeper levels of the tree to the higher levels of the tree. And that's also why, for example, uh, when he was highlighting the, U the URL in the block on the left-hand side or, or the user, no matter which one, first you saw that that thing had a uh, uh, was completely marked as red because that was a thing that where the the dependency was originating from, but then the things that were containing it did have the red borders. That's the tree bubbling that you are seeing there. So, in practice, to make this more, um, to, to take it from concept to practice, basically, try to make this thought process a habit, please. So, whenever you are rendering something, so when you're building a render array, just be actually conscious that you are rendering something because that means you have to think of cacheability. If you aren't, then there is no way that we can make things cacheable automatical, automatically, that we can invalidate correctly, then we can vary correctly. So just as soon as you're dealing with render arrays, remember, oh, I'm rendering something, that means that maybe there is something dynamic in there, and then, of course, I must think of cacheability. Second step, is this something expensive that I'm rendering? And therefore, is it worth caching? If yes, use cache keys, and that's exactly the same as in Drupal 7. Remember if you had a render array, or maybe many of you haven't used render caching in Drupal 7, but that existed in Drupal 7. Um, so basically if you had a render array, you could set pound cache, and then within pound cache you set keys. And the keys are concatenated to form the cache ID that will be used for caching that specific thing, for identifying the address of that thing um, so that we can retrieve it later on and don't have to re-render the entire thing again. So Whenever you are doing something expensive, like for example, rendering a node. A node consists of fields, and those fields maybe contain references to other entities, and so we have to do a whole lot of things to figure out uh, what should actually be displayed, take into account access checking as well. That is pretty complex, right? So we do want to make sure that we don't do all of that work on every single page load. Um, but if it's something tiny, like maybe just a single field, do not bother caching, because if we're caching every single bit on the page individually, we'll end up with hun hundreds or maybe even thousands of cache requests, cache retrievals on every page. Like, that doesn't make sense. So choose the things that are expensive to be cached individually. So find cache keys and then specify keys. Now comes the actual cacheability metadata. Um, we had cache keys just now, but maybe there are different representations of that same thing. Maybe um, it is varying on a combination of permissions or maybe even URL or interface language or something else. If, if the answer is yes, I am varying by something, no matter what it is, then you should use cache contexts. So basically, in the example of, of a node, let's assume that um, maybe some field in there was only accessible with users to users with a certain permission. In that case, you would specify pound cache contexts and then user dot permissions. Um, and that would then make sure that we don't have one cache item. No, we have one per combination of roles. So if I have role, if I have permissions A and B and he has permissions B and C, we would be seeing different things. If we would both have A and B, then we would be seeing the same thing. So one cache entry or two cache entries would be created. And this is very, 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 very similar to the HTTP very header. You specify in the HTTP very header whether it varies by cookie or by accept header or by whatever. This is very analogous. You specify which things in the request context you vary by. The next one is the one that um, you'll probably be seeing most often. Um, if you're rendering something, quite often you're depending on something else. So basically, what causes the representation of the thing I'm rendering to become outdated? If there is some such thing, then you should use cache tags. So for example, if you're rendering something that uses maybe the title of Node 5, then you specify the Node 5 cache tag. 
if you're also showing the author, or maybe just linking to the author, but not even showing the name of the author, just something of the author that might change because maybe the URL contains um, the URL alias, as in the username, so user slash whim, for example. If that if I change my nickname, then that's also something that should be invalidated. So tag it with that. If I use a taxonomy term, tag it with that. So the data dependencies must be uh, specified to Drupal. And then finally, um, if there is a time dependency, so if there is a chance that this thing could become outdated, then you should use MaxH. Um, the default is caching permanently, which means this never is going to become outdated unless invalidated by a cache tag, meaning that, for example, user three had changed. I've, I've changed my username, so then it should be invalidated. But other than that, other than data changes, this thing will or should remain unchanged forever. So then, in that case, say, hey, this thing is cacheable forever, permanently cacheable. Um, if it's not, then you can specify a number, an integer, which is just a number of seconds that it's valid, just like HTTP. Because this is, again, very similar to the HTTP cache control header. The max h value that you specify there is exactly like this. So given those five things, um, that could seem overwhelming uh, to have to think about all of those things. It, you don't want to go and specify um, these cache tags manually, like node colon five. It's too easy to make a silly typo and then have it not work as you would expect. But usually you are working with objects. You're usually working with a node object or a user object. You do a node load in Drupal 7, similarly in Drupal 8. And whenever you encounter something like that, if you are building a render array and you're using objects to fill that render array with useful information, uh, the renderer, which is the class that represents what Drupal Render does in Drupal 7, um, it has a method called add cacheable dependency, which basically says, hey, my render array, it depends on this, the, this thing, but that thing is actually cacheable. Please adopt, as, absorb that cacheability metadata into the render array so that my render array is actually varied automatically by those things. So it's as simple as specifying, uh, as calling that method. So for example, um, if you're using, so in Drupal 8 we have config, we have config objects, and those have cache tags as well. So whenever the configuration changes, for example, if my site's name is changed because I had a typo in it, um, then I want that markup which says welcome to the website where the website is and the, site, the name of the website. I want to make sure that whenever the configuration changes that actually the markup is changed as well, as in everywhere where that appears, whether it be on one page or a million pages, that only those pages that have it are invalidated. Just calling that method does, makes it so that you don't have to deal with uh, the cache tags manually. So talking about it at a higher level, um, what Fabian has shown you is something akin to this. Um, basically, Drupal pages are nested, have lots of things, have lots of uh, data. It's a graph of things, basically, that you are dealing with. But any of those things may have cache tags, cache context, and so on. And the problem was that basically if any one of those things, let's say that the blue node on the right-hand side, um, that it has a access check that is so dynamic, so complex, that it cannot possibly be cached. So therefore it says, hey, this node should actually be rendered with max h zero, because the reason for showing it is so dynamic that I cannot possibly invalidate it at a future time, so please don't cache it at all. That used to mean, and still means in Drupal 8 uh, had today, that the entire page is infected by that max h zero. It cannot be possibly be cached, because there is something deep down there, even if it's just a silly single character thing, if you will, that means that the entire page cannot possibly be cached. And so detecting that, detecting that max h zero and deciding, hey, this thing is too dynamic, let's not infect the entire page with that. Let's put a placeholder instead so that big pipe or single flush plus JavaScript or maybe even another render strategy because Fabian has shown several, but it's possible for you guys to come up with more. ESI could be another possible example. Um, it then allows us to cache the entire page, but just not that dynamic bit and avoid that infection and then ensure that we have a decent cache hit ratio. And that, then that does, that does make the website fast again. So taking a bigger step back again, remember that I started with dependencies, dependencies, dependencies. The problem was that Drupal 7 didn't do that. So if we compare Drupal rendering a page to building a ship, 
And this could be Drupal 8. Uh, a nice clear ship, the structure is clear, assembled from components, the dependencies are clear. So this kind of makes sense. You would probably build a ship this way, right? You want to think about the dependencies, you don't want it to sink, you don't want people to suddenly die because the engine compartment isn't properly isolated from the rooms or whatever, which Drupal 7 isn't that good at, then this would be kind of like Drupal 7. <laughs> it's still, it is still a boat, it is still a boat, and it will probably be able to get you from A to B. And it worked this way, but the problem was that we weren't aware of the dependencies. It was seemingly randomly constructed. Every single bit in a Drupal 7 page, or almost every single bit, was gathered on every single page load for no good reason. It was just because we weren't thinking about dependencies. And in Drupal 8 we are. And the consequence is that we can make things much faster, as, as Fabian has demonstrated. So that's kind of the message I want to give dependencies, think about it. Um, and so looking at a few common scenarios, um, if you're depending on configuration, as I mentioned, don't forget to add its cache tags. Use that handy method. Give it the render array that you're working with, give it the object that you're dealing with, a config object, and it will take care of it for you. If you're using an entity, even if it's just a tiny, tiny little bit, even if it's just one value of a field, or if it's just a title, no matter what, don't forget to add its cache tags using the same method. Give it the entity object. And even if you're using just a value of a field, don't think that you need to not specify a cache tag because it was just a value of a field. No, it, that value of a field was actually part of the entity. The entity object is where it's coming from, so specify a dependency on that entity just pass the entity object again because that's where you were getting the field from in the first place. If you have uncacheable data, just specify max h zero. Or if it's if it maybe is considered by you to be okay to be outdated only thirty seconds for example, then you could say, okay, max h equals thirty. Thirty seconds is then still allowing for some level of cacheability, but it's up to you. Um, but don't forget to specify that it's at least not permanently cacheable because that will lead to horrible end results. Manually rendering a link. Remember that URL example from earlier. If you're still using so Drupal 8 currently in its current state, we are still working on, on that aspect, trying to figure out the best way forward. But Drupal 8 still allows the same kind of URL rendering where you just call the URL function and it is completely unaware of the dependencies that are actually incoming. It's just talking to the overall request context and configuration state of Drupal, which makes it so that we cannot possibly bubble that cacheability metadata that is actually associated with a link. We don't know that the, that it's given giving you back, for example, slash uh, NL for, net for Dutch, slash node, slash one, because the currently negotiated language is Dutch. There is no way to know. So instead of doing that, Please use in Twig, or in, in Twig you can use a link or URL functions. That works just fine. But when you're rendering a link, you should actually be thinking about using type link. Why? Because when rendering a link, you're actually rendering markup. And the L function in Drupal 7 and in 8 is about actually sidestepping the, the renderer, Drupal renderer in, in, in general. Because um, it is actually markup, but we have never been treating it that way. So let's just start treating it as markup. Use point type link, and then you will be fine. And a few more advanced scenarios. Um, maybe you're varying by cookie. Maybe you're showing some information that actually is coming directly from a cookie. This is maybe a little bit far-fetched, but let's assume, and this is actually something that quite a few websites do, if you've logged in at some point uh, in an e-commerce website, and um, the user's session has expired because he hasn't visited for a week, for example, you want to provide a nicer experience. So you want to say, hi, Wim, or hi, Fabian. But you aren't actually logged in, so you're getting that information from a cookie to create a nicer user experience. But that actually does mean that you are varying by that cookie information. And you don't want to make, you want to make sure that I don't see hi, Fabian, I want to see hi, Wim. And it's important, again, th to then specify the right cache context. So you can even specify cache contexts on things that aren't Drupal inherent, because of things we saw earlier, like user.permissions, that's really Drupal concepts. But cookies call on username is basically saying, I want to vary by the cookie with the ID, the name, username. So all of that is also possible. And then finally, an example that Fabian uh, has actually encountered in his performance uh, 
uh, consulting work, um, device cookies. Basically, to ensure that the website is optimized for a certain device. Maybe that's not always the nicest solution, but it is something that you see in the real world. In Drupal 8, what we do is, uh, what we also have, which I didn't mention yet, is the concept of required cache context. So some cache context we don't want you to have to worry about because every single render array is going to at least depend on the theme system because it uses templates. Therefore, it is always depending on the theme system. So we always specify the theme cache context for you so you don't have to worry about that. But another one that is almost always used is the team function, the T function, right? Uh, translating text, translating strings. So we are taking care of the interface language cache context for you as well. But then we just can choose for a certain website. Maybe your website is varying on almost every single page by a certain cookie or by a certain permission or by something. You can specify your own cache context, by the way. You can add a country cache context, for example, to make sure that the, the, the uh, the markup is varied automatically by country. Um, so all we're doing here is specifying another one that is going to be used everywhere so that you don't have to do, have to go through the effort of repeating the same thing all across your site if you have your site-specific knowledge that your site is going to be varied by some advanced thing all over. So that's really all we had. So hope we hope you liked it. And if you have any questions... <laughs> Uh, one little note, please. Um, I want to thank Tech One Consulting for sponsoring the work on the Render Cache module for 7x and um, the Drupal Association actually for providing me with a grant to work on some pre work for th all the stuff you today saw. So, if I could ask you a favor, if you liked what you saw today and you want to see more of great performance work in Drupal 8, please donate to Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 Accelerate. Uh, that would be great because it makes things like this possible, makes things like this in views possible, so that cacheability is everywhere great. That's one big deal we are working on right now. And uh, last thing I want to um, thank Akia's Office of the CTO, uh, who, who have sponsored some of that big pipe stuff. Thanks. And finally, if you want to read more about this, we do have decent documentation already about these things <laughs> where you can actually r read more about it in silence and if, y if there are things unclear, ping me on IRC or ping me on Twitter and we will work on improving the documentation further and last but not least Big Pipe as Fabian demonstrated it there is an issue in, in, the, in the core queue and it's right there listed below and if there are questions feel free to ask now <laughs>